Okay, everyone, we're getting started again. I'd um, like to introduce Peter Brabeck Lethmoth, the chairman of Nestle, and David Crane, who is the senior operating executive of Pegasus Capital Advisors and also a B team leader. So we like yeah. to think of him as the A team. <laughs> um, David, we're, we're going to start with you. Uh, a lot of people know your story. You were the CEO of NRG in the United States for 12 years, but you have a different title now. <laughs> um, give us the, the two-minute version of, of what happened. Well, I mean, I, I don't know how many people in the room actually know what NRG is, but NRG is uh, the second largest power generation company in the United <coughs> States, and it's, it's important from a carbon perspective because uh, we were emitting 100 million tons of carbon a year, which if that, uh, if that was a sovereign nation would put us about 40th on the anthropomorphic. Uh, wow. And uh, most of those emissions, not surprisingly, are from uh, coal-fired power plants. And uh, starting about 2006, uh, when I was CEO, I thought that that was not going to be sustainable long-term. I mean, sustainable in the environmental sense, but also I didn't think uh, from a business perspective that was sustainable. So we started a plan to try and transform the company from brown to green, to make it simple, go into renewables. And we made a lot of progress. I mean, we became the largest solar power company in the United States. But, but uh, you know, at one point, uh, you know, the stock market was not rewarding it. And uh, as of December of last year, 2015, you know, I, w I was basically fired. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's uh, what happened. So the transformation, I would say, certainly personally wasn't successful. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. um, so anyway, so the, the, the two lessons that I would draw from that that I would uh, share with uh, this audience, and the first one is sort of on a personal level because I recognize that there are a lot of younger people in the room, is, uh, you know, uh, I didn't have this philosophy at the time, but I would say the younger people in the room is that if in the course of your career, you know, you really believe something's right, and I believe going from brown to green was right both morally and as a business mm -hmm. opportunity. And, you know, you get, and if you don't get fired at least once in your career for doing the right thing, then you're not trying hard enough. Okay. So, so, that's, so that's my advice to the young people. Um, the bigger picture thing, which I think is relevant to what we're supposed to be discussing here, is that it's very hard as a public company to make an internal transformation. And we've heard from several of the C CEOs of major oil companies today, and all of them are uh, working in the area of renewables in, in addition to oil and gas. But what none of them said is there's no way, given the, the current scale of renewables, they can make that business relevant to given the size of their oil and gas. And right. That's the problem I faced. I mean, we were the largest solar power company in the United States, and it was less than 10% of our overall generation. And so the market, the public market, never cared. And, uh, and we never got rewarded for it. And if you don't get rewarded for it on the stock market, there's going to come a time when you're going to be asked to leave. And so, right. so to me, that's a big issue because energy is two-thirds of the climate change problem, and the energy industry, the fossil fuel energy industry, is a $6 trillion a year industry. Mm -hmm. And so... That's one of the things we have to figure out. Right, and before I bring in Peter, you, you have this interesting phrase, this notion of the climate competent board. Could you explain what that means? Well, I mean, I think one of the problems we have, and, and, and Peter is, is, you know, who's done wonderful things, is, is, I mean, he can actually speak knowledgeably about the North American side of things and the European side of things, so I should just let him speak. But, but I would say that, you know, we're quite a bit behind in North America relative to where the best European uh, companies are right now. But I would say if you think about corporate governance, right now corporate governance is an obstacle to the private sector leading the way on climate change. And uh, you should think about corporate governance for public companies as management, board of directors, and major institutional investors. And to me, the biggest obstacle in the North American context right there is the board of directors because you see the pressure coming at the pension funds and all. It's not really actually getting through to the fund managers, but right. and, and management feels it from their employees and from their customers. But the board is this insulated group sort of in the middle, and they're really important. And, and so one of the things through the B team we're trying to advocate is the idea of a client competent or sometimes I like to call it client capable board where you know, the boards have competences and things like audit <coughs> and things like that, that the boards really need people on them that understand climate change and, and develop it as 
both part of the company's opportunistic strategy and also as part of their risk mitigation strategy. Right. So Peter, take us inside your boardroom. Climate change comes up. How is it discussed? Are the per cer certain people advocating for it? Just give us a sense of how it plays out behind those closed doors. Yeah, I must say our experience is quite different to yours. I mean, I had on my board sitting 25 years, 30 years ago, a man who was called Stefan Schmidheine. Mm -hmm. And if you remember those, I mean, most of the young ones, he was the first one uh, who was responsible for the first Rio meeting on environmental issues. Mm -hmm. So I had him, he was at that time uh, about 40 years old, he was on my board and he was already pushing our company to become environmentally involved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And from then onwards, I had always one or the other of our board members who were coming from the NGO environment. I have Anne Veneman, uh, who was the head of UNICEF and very much uh, worried about uh, climate change and the impact mm -hmm. on children, for example. Okay, So in the board composition, I always had one or two board members who were definitely personally strongly engaged on environmental issues. And therefore the board was constantly discussing these things. Mm -hmm. That's why we were active. Again, I was personally involved in the second one, uh, Rio meeting, I was personally there. I was personally involved in the establishment of the sustainability goals, where I was a water ambassador uh, in this in this effort. So we, we, we are constantly at the board level, very much involved in this uh, subject. And when something's on the table, uh, directors are advocating for something, yet other people are saying, you know, but we have a fiduciary responsibility. Sometimes, you know, the environmental yeah. initiatives are not good for the bottom line. So how did well you resolve those? Yeah, I will tell you uh, how we did this. We discussed this at length uh, some years ago, and then we decided to change the bylaws of our company. And we put into the bylaws uh, that our objective and our purpose was the creation of value, of long-term sustainable value, both for shareholders and for society. And I put this up for the vote to the General Assembly. And we got a 99% vote to change our bylaws. Now this is very clear an indication that the type of investors that we want to have are the long-term sustainable value investors. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of them. And I definitely do not want to have the short-term investors and hedge funders. Now, I still have them. I have about 1% of my shareholders are short-term and hedge funds, mm -hmm. but it's only 1%. And if you see the long-term investors, you will see that they are encouraging you more and more and more to have sustainability on your agenda, and very clearly. And in our General Assembly, we, have, we are spending as much time about presenting the societal balance sheet as we are doing the financial balance sheet. Right. But how does that experience square with what you went through? What I, I don't even recognize. <laughs> <laughs> this is an alternative universe. I don't universe even recognize what Peter is talking about. But <laughs> I, I would say Peter said a couple of things that are really relevant. One is, and part of our, you know what we're advocating through the B team of a client competent board is having a client ch uh, climate champion on the board. It's not enough, but it's necessary. Someone who really believes, who can get it on the board agenda. Because I would say that no board member at my company ever wanted to talk about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say that, I mean, you know I'm a fairly outspoken person. From the time I started talking about, you know, we, we cannot continue to emit a ton of carbon for every megawatt we make, you know, back in 2006, you know, I went through uh, probably 45, 50 board meetings and never once did I feel comfortable enough to say to my American board, we should be doing this because this is the right thing to do. Right. This is the morally right thing to do. This is, this is saving the planet. You know, I always made the argument for going from brown to green, embracing renewables. This is the high growth part. This is a risk mitigation strategy. You know, and you know, in terms that is consistent with, I think, what's more the American approach, which is it's still single bottom line. Right. You know, <laughs> it's like it's profit on the bottom line and growth. 
and, and, you know, and I made the argument that this is where the growth was in the industry. But the idea that you would spend half of your annual shareholders meeting talking about what we're doing right for society, right. that's not part of the American corporate experience. And in terms of the, the institutional investors in the United States, did you hear any interest or pull from them? Never. Yeah. Never. And I mean, I mean, you, well, I mean, you know, like the head of CalPERS, the head of the big pension right. funds, <coughs> they say the right thing. Right. But as the head of a, a CEO, when you're having an investor meeting, you're having an investor meeting with the fund manager. And fund managers would say to me, look, when, when the boss starts compensating me in a different way, you know, then, then I will care about these issues. Right. The, the, the analogy I draw is sometimes when you're in investor meetings as a public company CEO, They'll say to you, you know, what is the most important thing to you as CEO, or what do you lose sleep over at night? And I would always, you know, shock them because I would say, well, the single most important thing to me running an industrial company is that every one of my 11,000 employees goes home at night in the same condition that they went to work in the morning. Mm -hmm. But never once in, you know, probably 500 investor meetings did any uh, institutional investor ask me, what is your company's record on? employee safety, and we were top decile in our industry. We were very proud of that, but that was something we did for ourselves. I think doing something about climate change, you know, if we're really gonna win this with the private sector lead, we need to get doing something about the climate up to that same level of, this is just a moral imperative that you have to do everything that your company can do, and I think we have a ways to go. Right. Uh, and, you know, certainly responsive boards would be uh, Right. Good step in that direction. So I'm going to name both of you king of worldwide corporate governance. You can do anything you want to change the corporate governance system so that at every company, climate change becomes part of the agenda. How do you make that happen? What would that look like? How do we institutionalize this discussion that isn't happening at a lot of companies? Uh, Peter, do you want to start? Well, I'm, I must say, no, I feel very happy. If I show you the letters I receive from my shareholders, right. okay, they are demanding from me what is our policy on climate change, what is our engagement environmental, they want to see what we are doing, and those are the, my preferred shareholders. Now, those are people like the Norges, the Singapore State uh, um, Investment Fund, mm -hmm. the, the, the big funds, okay, the long term, the Black Rocks. I mean, uh, BlackRock was sending a letter to all of his uh, investment partners, it's the biggest one, mm. and you read the letter, and he is demanding, saying, don't make uh, stock buybacks, okay? I want you to invest some money in responsible, sustainable things. He's telling me, look for the long term, don't give quarterly statements. Mm -hmm. So I have no issue, I'm happy Kay. with mine, but I have chosen my shareholders, okay? Yeah. I get one letter in my now almost 20 something years, okay? I got one letter from a hedge fund who was saying I couldn't care less, I want to have you improve your margins, mm -hmm. one. Okay. But I'm getting the all the other letters talking really about. I think we have to get, if, if you want anything, it, it has to come from the financial markets also. I think in this respect, if you have a shareholder base mm. that is not only supporting you, that is challenging you, mm. the way we have it, I must say, I feel very comfortable. Yeah, you're in charge of the world. <laughs> well, I would just say, well, I mean, for what I already said, I mean, for, for every board, particularly every board of an admitting company to have a, a climate champion, as I said, uh, and let me emphasize, I'm not saying that, you know, a major polluter has to put the head of Greenpeace I'm just talking about, I call it the Michael Bloomberg school of like, you know, red-blooded capitalists, but understands what's at stake mm -hmm. with climate change. So that's one. Secondly, in the United States, the first thing that any board of directors has done when it, they're formed is they get a briefing from some law firm on how to avoid being sued. Um, it would be good if there was that type of educational process for the people who, you know, may not be in admitting issues right. about how important it is. But the third thing I would say in the United States, under this thing called Sarbanes-Oxley, we, every American public company is required to do an enterprise risk management study every year, sort of what are the long-term risks to our company. But the way it works is you spend a lot of time on the study, you give it to the board, <coughs> they read it, and then it's put into a file, and then you do it again a year later. Right. Uh, you know, at least part of that 
study should be made public and in, in a world where quarterly reporting is not going away in the United States, you should have to report every quarter on what progress you're making. If you identify, as we would have at NRG, that the risk of go a carbon-constrained world is one of our biggest risks, you should report, have to report every quarter on what you've done uh, you know, to, to mitigate that risk. Mm -hmm. you, because the long term is made up of, uh, if you're a public company CEO, the long term is made up of a bunch of quarters. Uh, you know, m you know, in my case, 12 years, 48 yeah. quarters. So, uh, so that's what I would do if I was the king of corporate government. Right. And as you replayed the movie in your head of your 12 years running NRG, would you have, looking back, would you have done anything differently if you had a do-over? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do tell. Well, I mean, one thing is I never, I mean, I was, I was picked to be the head of NR, for people that, again, don't know, I, I was, uh, NRG was sort of formed coming out of bankruptcy in 2003 as sort of the post Enron thing. And, and I was uh, picked to be CEO at the exact same time as the board. So I had no influence whatsoever on who was on the board. I never did. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that was not ideal in the long term because I, I certainly would have put some different, <laughs> you know, uh, points of view on the board. But I mean, I think a big mistake I made, I mean, I felt you know, I was very open that we cannot, you know, continue to run these coal plants and make money from them. And, I, you know, and once and investors will tolerate a lot of your stock price is going up. But when your stock, you know, the ironic thing about me getting fired is that is that uh, actually what drove the stock price down was that the market lost faith that there was a future right. in coal fired power plants. I mean, I mean, just as an example, I was fired basically a year ago. The stock was twelve dollars and thirty-five cents when I was fired. It's ten dollars and fifty cents today. So I mean, it was more getting rid of an irritant, and the irritant was we have a person running a coal-fired power company that all he wants to do is talk about the future of solar right. <laughs> you know, right. power. So I, I think if I had to do go over again, I'd be a little bit more discreet and you know a little bit uh, more political about what I say. Yeah, no, I appreciate the <laughs> candor. Um, we're going to go to questions in one second. Um, Peter, when we were talking before, you know, most of our discussions here at the conference <coughs> are about carbon emissions, but I know you've got some concerns about the water supply around the world. So give us your, your headline concerns there. No, what I'm saying is, I mean, climate change, there's no doubt, is a very important subject. But I think where we may, might improve is that we do not spend all our energy on climate change, but we are starting to analyze better what is the impact of climate change of the most urgent issues that humankind has. And there are two things. One is clearly how we are going to feed this increasing population when we have every second two more people to feed and one acre less of arable land. And the second one is where are we going to get the water, which today we are 20% overusing that what we have sustainably available? 20% already. 10 years ago when I started to discuss water, it was 10%. And I wanted to prevent. I said we are going to run out of water. It will be 40% in the year 2030. I had hoped that I would be able to do something that we would not get worse. Well, we got worse. So that's my, that's my issue. My issue is, yes, of course, climate change is important and climate change will have an impact. But let's discuss and let's analyze what is the impact, for example, on the food supply of this world, mm -hmm. to be more concrete about it and then concentrate on this. Then we will not make some of this aberration like biofuel. I mean, I heard today again, you know, uh, yeah, we are going to change over to biofuel. But wait a moment, to produce one liter of bioethanol, 4,600 liters of water, one liter of biodiesel, the preferred thing in Europe for until the Volkswagen crisis, and now we don't talk about biodiesel anymore, okay? 9,600 liters of water. And this is being considered for the climate change fanatics as a great solution. Well, I cannot be in agreement with that, yeah. okay? That's a good so that's why I'm saying, you know, don't look at only from one angle, but take it and say, what is the impact on energy supply, 
We have more than 1.6 billion of people that they don't have an electric light today. They will demand energy. Now, how we are going to get this, taking into consideration all the constraints which come from climate change. But be more concrete and be more realistic about this discussion by focusing on the big issues that will that are affecting humankind today. Yeah, that's a great point. Let's. I'm sure there's questions from the audience for them. <coughs> In front here, we'll start. If we could get a microphone. It's a question for David. Uh, I'm Philip Rose from Energy Intelligence. Uh, you mentioned that uh, a, a number of oil companies are investing in renewable energy, but uh, it's a problem for them because it's very difficult for to make it relevant financially uh, to their board and investors. Uh, but is it the right thing to do, really, for them, I'm wondering, to try to go from brown to green? Is, wouldn't it be better just to return the money to the shareholders and shrink and let other people uh, reinvest that money into green? Yeah, it, it's, uh, that's a very, very, very uh, good question. Uh, and, you know, one, I mean, oil companies are so large, I mean, they can, well, look, let me say this, you know, as someone who cares about the climate, I wouldn't recommend that because the re oil companies are so large, the resources they have, you know, y you don't want to sort of say to them, look, you know, just ignore this issue. I mean, and of course, this, I think the issue that oil and gas companies should be most focused on this area is actually, uh, you know, finding a way for people to use their product without putting carbon in the atmosphere. Uh, but, but your point as a matter of a public company is, 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 <coughs> is very prescient. The, the argument that I would get from investors that I could never counteract in, they would look at the company that NRG was trying to be, and an investor, uh, say a Fidelity, would say to me, okay, so you've got all these coal plants, but you're also doing residential solar. Why should I, you know, transformation is difficult. Why shouldn't I just go buy Dynegy to have exposure to coal plants and, and Solar City to have exposure to residential solar? And I never had any answer uh, to that because from their perspective, you know, that was, you know, that gave them more flexibility, the, you know, and, and the investment community loves pure play now. So this, it's a big, I don't, you know, I don't have an answer that is a good one. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Who else? Going once, going twice. Do you miss running a public company? Um, I mean, I did it for a long time and, uh, you know, Peter's done it for, or did it for a long time. I mean, there are aspects of it, the investor meetings, the quarterly earnings, which, you know, uh, you know, spending all of October doing line item budget reviews, spending all of January, uh, you know, reviewing personal, which I don't miss at all. But, you know, uh, sort of, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, you know, die in the wool capitalist and I big, I believe that big companies can solve big social issues or lead the way on that. So I miss that. I think we were, we were having an impact in what we were trying to do and, and, and the internal motivations. I mean, one, you know, even though most of the people that work there came from the traditional side of the energy industry, I think that they responded to the transformation we're doing better than any CEO could have expected. So I miss the leadership aspect. I miss the fact that, you know, I think we were having the type of impact that Nestle has, yeah. you know, in the areas that they, they focus on. That's right. Well, I'm going to turn the stage over to my colleague, Keith. Oh, we have one more question back there, and we do have time for it. So thank you. Miss, Mr. Brabeck, you said um, uh, you wanted the uh, investors who go for the long, long term, the value creation. Um, could you describe which pressure you have felt in the past from the uh, short-term investors in this case? Yeah, I told you before, I mean, in all these years, I received one letter from a short-term investor, which was a hedge fund, uh, who, like any activist, uh, was demanding <laughs> that, we would, uh, that we would have to improve uh, some margin and some, some businesses, optimize this more, and to deliver short-term results. And my answer was uh, very simple. I think uh, you have not read very well uh, the bylaws of my company, because if you want to invest into my company, we have clearly stated, supported by 99% of my shareholders, that we are running this company for the long term. You see, I don't, 
I understand your frustration, but I don't have that. <laughs> because as a CEO, I went once a year on a road show. We don't give quarterly profit. We, we leave the half yearly one uh, to the chief financial officer. And I dared once to say, you know, uh, I leave the relationship with uh, the shareholders. I leave it to my CFO. That he can explain to the shareholders uh, what, what, uh, what and how we are performing. I reserve my relationship with the shareholders to what I call chairman's roundtable, where I'm not discussing about the operational aspects. I'm talking about exactly those issues that we are talking now, about the environmental impact of the company and what we are doing on this, on, on this area, the long-term strategy of the company, all what is very interesting and very fascinating. But I'm not talking with them once about the operational result. I leave this to the CFO, okay? He can, he can explain to them. I run the company, he explains how we run the company. I'm talking about what <laughs> is important to, this, uh, to, to, to my shareholders in the long run, if, if they want to be our shareholders. Can, can I ask, what did you do with the letter? I answered it. I know, but did you throw it out after? No, no, no. no. I kept put it in a frame? Put it in a on frame. The wall? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. uh -huh. I hope it's the last one I received okay. th this time. Uh, please join me in thanking the panelists for their <laughs> candid and provocative thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Turn it over to Keith.